Hey, Black Like Me podcast family. These are crazy times we're living in. But interestingly enough, I'm seeing things that are encouraging, like record numbers of downloads of our podcasts, like quadrupling our best numbers. It's just it's crazy. And so I'm hoping that this momentum continues. Having said that, we're doing a couple of things for our new listeners because there are lots of you and I'm glad about it. A couple of things. One, subscribe. When you go to get the pod, the, the, the podcast, just subscribe. That helps so much. Secondly, if you get a chance, write a review. Those of us who lead podcasts led by African-Americans don't get a lot of reviews because we don't think to push that. If you would go and write a review on iTunes, wherever you find it, that would help us immensely. Thirdly, click the Patreon link. If just a small percentage of those who enjoy the podcast, who consider it helpful, would just go and just support us monthly at just any nominal amount, it makes a huge difference. So don't think that it doesn't matter. It does. Please do so. Now, we're going to do something that we don't typically do. We have so much material that we don't typically replay material. But with so many people who have joined the family recently, we thought that it would be important to bring out some classics. And so this one is my interview with Robin D'Angelo, Dr. Robin D'Angelo, who is the author of White Fragility. That's not just a name or a title we throw at people. It's a thing. And it gets in the way of true, true um racial equity. And so we thought we would just repurpose this so that you could listen to the conversation, find yourself in it or someone else you know about. But we think this is a way of going back in our vaults and bringing some very key discussions to you to help you navigate these times where we need our allies to be fully um, strengthened and knowledgeable in, in what works and what doesn't work in terms of race relations. All right, take a listen to this. This is gonna help you a lot. Post about your reflections, retweet it, share it, send it to friends, um, make good use of it because we think this is really powerful. Thank you. Hey, 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 good people. Grits or cream of wheat? Who the hell is racist? Does anyone ever ask if they touch your hair? <laughs> Woo. Black Like Me. You're listening to Black Like Me with Dr. Alex G., a podcast that invites you to experience the world through the perspective of one black man, one conversation, one story, or even one rant at a time. Here's Dr. G. Hey, 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 Black Like Me podcast family members. I want to let you know that we have some brand new Patreon supporters. I wish I had a bell or something around here that I could that I could ring. Um, this is really exciting. So Andrea Dearlove, Nicole Fromm, and Patrick Ryan. I want to thank you for being our three newest Patreon supporters. That's great because that level of support allows us to continue to bring you great programming. And so we want more people to do this. So keep listening, click the link and um, see what level might work for you. I'm really excited about this. Hey, I want to have a little fun with something. Also, every state in the union is listening to black like me has downloaded black like me except for four states. So I'm doing a shout out to all of my Black Like Me listeners. And this is not to put any state on blast or embarrass them. It's really meant to be fun. I just want to bring them into, I want to bring them into the family. But if you know people in Montana, in both of the, the Dakotas, South and North Dakota, and West Virginia, I need you to call your friends, your cousins, your colleagues, send them a link and just say, hey, come on. Come on, you know, you got to listen to one of these podcasts, send them a link to the one you think might pertain to them. But I want to be able to say we have listeners in all 50 states. So please, again, that's Montana, South Dakota, North Dakota and West Virginia. Black Like Me podcast family. I know that you can help me get to these four states. Let's do this. After last week's podcast where we talked about it. It was another installment in our genealogy series, but it was entitled Interse Intersectionality. And it really talked about the strife between black women and white women or the relationship or lack thereof between black women and white women. We have had incredible feedback on that. I think we've had more text and phone calls um, immediately after an episode has dropped with this particular episode than any that I can think of in the past year or so. So I'm very, very excited about that. That was about Meg, Roy and, and my daughter, Lexi, both of whom are descendants of, of, of Reuben Joshua G. So if you've not listened to that, 
go and listen to it because it's really, really powerful. And um, again, it just gives us a framework. Where else do you get to listen to a black woman and a white woman who are descendants of the same guy, but through two women that he was with talking together 150, 160 years later about how that has had an impact on the relationships between black and white women. You want to hear that. And hey, speaking of relationships between black and white women, um, this next episode is going to be fire also. Um, And in this next episode, I'm talking with Robin D'Angelo. And a theme that comes up is something that, that I call white women's tears. And we talk about the role or the that that plays or even the roadblock that offers in race relations. This is a very truth telling, insightful, very honest dialogue. And I think this is just going to blow your socks off. And so as you're listening to this upcoming episode, I hope that you have a different understanding or you you loosen your grip on, on your heart and your mind so that you might understand what racism really looks and feels like. When I talk to people about their racism, my white friends about their racism it's not because I want to accuse them. You need to be freed of some things. And so I hope that this episode will help you to look at things a little differently. It's one of my favorite interviews. So um, enjoy this segment and um, holler at me. Let me know what you think about it. One of the reasons I started the Black Like Me podcast is because I want to encourage people to think about race relations in America and the world and to be able to talk about it. Today, I'm really excited and honored to have on my show Dr. Robin D'Angelo. She's an amazing thinker and educator who hit the scene some years ago um, by by coining a phrase white fragility and writing about it. She received her Ph.D. in multicultural education from the University of Washington in Seattle. Um, She received she earned her tenure at Westfield State University in Massachusetts, and she's currently the affiliate and affiliate associate professor of education at the University of Washington. She has this background in talking with white people about white fragility and and helping to understand why racial discussions are so, so important. And I've been needing to have a discussion with Dr. D'Angelo for many, many years. And I'm so glad that our (laughs) that our paths have crossed. Dr. D'Angelo, thank you so much for being my guest on Black Like Me today. Well, I'm just thrilled to be your guest. Thank you. Sure. Listen, I I know that your schedule is busy, so I appreciate your time. You and I were talking off air a little bit that we have um, a mutual acquaintance, um, Eddie Moore Jr., who does the White Privilege Conference. And um, I was in Seattle when you were a plenary speaker at at one of his regional gatherings and my plane landed too late. I had to get my rental car. I just missed your keynote. But we were we were in the same space. But um, but I heard that you tore it up. And 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 I just think that it's just it's just great to meet colleagues who are committed to this area of work. So I'm really, really excited about getting into our discussion and uh, and just finding out a little bit more about each other. And so you're known for for having written white fragility, but you've also written what does it mean to be white and is everyone really equal? So so you've been contributing to this area of thought for a number of years and you have a number of pieces out there that talk about it. And I know that that's got to be gratifying, but it's also got to be um, it's got to make you weary a little bit talking about this all the time, I would imagine. <laughs> well, um, so you named the books that I've written, but also, you know, many, many, many articles. And my objective is always to take every day familiar uh, white racial dynamics and make them really clear and visible. And in fact, I don't ever get tired of talking about it. There's nothing uh, I'd rather be talking about because it's so incredibly important, particularly in this cultural and political moment. Uh, I mean, I am a deep believer that if I'm not making some kind of difference, if I'm not continually being challenged myself, then I'm not sure what my uh, life's purpose is. And so I do get gratified. And um, looking into the face of white apathy uh, on racism day in and day out is discouraging. Yes. Wow. Um, you're right. You're right. I hear you. You know, one of the questions I have for you, and I'm sure you get asked this all the time, but um, just for our listeners, um, many of whom may be just now introduced to your work. What was the aha moment? For you, I mean, your PhD is in multicultural <laughs> education, um, and, and and you know, there's a, there's an aspect of us, those of us who are academics, where where it's it's um, it's head knowledge or something that we're really passionate about learning, um, or something we want to learn about. But then there are personal moments where something a light goes on, and we realize this is part of my purpose, and and there's sort of a calling uh, or a mandate to really address this. Do you remember what that was for you? Yeah, you know, I'm a little bit different in, in terms of being an academic in that 
most academics go from theory to practice, and I went from practice to theory. So I was <laughs> I get working it. out in the field, you know, as a you know what was called at the time a diversity trainer of in multiracial teams for years before I went to get my PhD. I, it was such an extraordinary experience as a white person to, to uh, you know, as my job to go in and try to talk to overwhelmingly white groups of people about racism. I mean, most of us who are white avoid doing that at all costs. Sure, we sure. We talk about racism in lots of uh, indirect ways, but, but not so much directly. I really wanted to apply all that I had learned and experienced during those years uh, to academia so that I could disseminate that knowledge uh, in, a, in a wider way. So for me, um, it actually wasn't a single moment. I, I see it a lot like mm-hmm. water dripping on a rock for white people to see sure. uh, racism and our role in it, and, and even today. Right. The forces to not see this for those of us who are white are so seductive and so strong. And so I can never be complacent and never just take for granted that I get it, Uh, because every moment that I push against the message that white is ideal, right, the messages of white supremacy and superiority, those messages are coming right back at me. Uh, But there was a a process that led to my ability to articulate what I'm able to now, and that was taking a job where I was, one, working side-by-side with people of color who were challenging the way that I saw the world. Mm -hmm. And part of being white is that I could, you know, I could have an advanced degree uh, and never have had my worldview challenged as a white person. I I wouldn't have been able to tell you I had a a racial worldview, right? I'm just a human. I'm just a person. You know know how we get uh, conditioned, those of us who are white. Uh, so I was working side by side with people of color, and then I was trying to talk to white people. You want to you want to understand how how white people pull off um, living in such a profoundly separate and unequal society at the same time that we claim that we were taught to see everybody the same and our race has no meaning. All you have to do is try to talk to white people about race. Just right. <laughs> this is what I would say to white people who always want to know. Oh, uh, you know, what do I do? Well, there are lots of answers to that question, but one is go go out and start talking to your fellow white people about race and racism and stick with the conversation. And just you will learn everything you need to know about how white people pull this off. Oh, oh, definitely. And I will tell you, having grown up in Madison, I know you were here just a few months ago. I had a conflict, so I wasn't able to go to the to the event. So um, some some mm-hmm. of my friends reached out to you to see if we could see, see if you could appear in the show. But I realized oh, yeah. that for like for our class reunions, I helped to um, organize our 30th and 35th class reunions. And my classmates have been reading about some of the work that I've done. There's a, a movement um, that we've created called Justified Anger, and it's really calling for systemic change and calling on our white allies to help us dismantle um, um, white constructs, um, social constructs that are providing barriers to to black folks and, and people of color. And these are folks, you know, we had gym class together. We showered together. We were friends together. We were at each other's homes. But it was so easy to say, but Alex, in high school, we didn't see race. What what happened to Madison? Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm I'm realizing that it's it's so tough for people because they've grown up in a world to believe that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and the Kennedys yeah. all helped to eradicate, you know, to eradicate all of this. And it really doesn't exist anymore. And so they want to know what's happened since they've left Madison because they just assumed because we all grew up in the area. Brian's song. Um, this was not an issue growing up. It's just that we never talked about it, but it was always an issue with two or three percent of the total population being non-white. Right. And so you're talking about your white my white friends, right? Exactly. That are, that exactly. Stated. This is what I this is what I would say to them who who want to claim that in high school, you know, you didn't know anything, you didn't see anything. Uh, if they're married, you know, open up their wedding albums and look through them, <laughs> right? Our weddings, big or small, are our circles, right? Who's really sitting at the table, right? We might go to a school, and you're not talking about you're not talking about the crew that some, cleans up after the wedding or the cooks. You're talking exactly. about you're talking about wedding parties. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I, I I'm fairly confident their wedding albums are, if not a hundred percent white, but pretty darn close. Yes. So you know, we're learning our place. Uh, and and I would That's challenge this idea that we didn't know anything or see anything. This idea that white people are innocent on race is just 
it's not true. Sure. You and know, young uh, people are not more innocent than, than right. older people. Either. Exactly. Exactly. I, I also read one of your quotes that we're not that the younger generation is not getting better at this. In fact, things are probably getting saucier. But one, one of the things um, I've just been looking at some of the quotes that you that you made over the years. And I just highlighted some of them because they really they, I, I resonate with them. And I think that they are poignant statements that need to be shared more broadly the the this and again you, you you probably been quoted all over the place but basically in <laughs> one place you were saying that um the, the downside of the racial divide and racial construct is that a white person can grow up and not have that interaction with black people not knowing any black people to invite not only to be in their wedding party but in the audience and there's not even mm-hmm. a knowledge that you, there's not even an awareness of what you have lost by not having it could you just mm-hmm. elaborate on that a little bit because what I'm hearing a lot in Madison is, you know, Alex, um, you know, there's not a lot of black people in my neighborhood, so they don't have any knowledge of the old covenants that didn't allow mad blacks to live in Nakoma or live in Shorewood. For those of you who are from that, the Madison area. Um, so so they were they don't even look at the history of why we're so segregated. But I think that point is so key that when people begin to awaken a little bit, the first response is, well, I don't know any black people. Um, I don't even, you know, I don't even know where to go to meet people, but they haven't even caught it, count, counted the cost of what it means to them or their children to have had no people of color in their lives. Yeah, you know, that's the, that's the place where I really got, um, it could, could connect in, in, I don't know how else to say it, mm-hmm. feel the message of internalized superiority for me as a white yes, person. Yes. That I could go cradle to grave, as most white people can right? Live, mm-hmm. love, work, play, uh, and, and die in racial segregation. And from black people in particular, and not one person who ever loved, mentored, or guided me growing up ever conveyed to me that I'd lost anything that mattered. Right. Uh, that is a deep message. In fact, it's the opposite, right? That white people measure the value of our schools and our neighborhoods by the absence of people of color and yes. black people in particular. Every day that we talk about a good neighborhood and mm-hmm. a good school, mm-hmm. we know what we're talking about. How, how are we measuring that? Honestly, <laughs> the absence of, of, of a significant number of black people. Yes. And to see that as good and, and nothing lost, the fundamental message is that there's no inherent value in the you know, perspectives, experiences, or in relationships across race for white people. In fact, not having those increases the value of basically everything for us as white people. That is a very deep message. You know, I'm never going to say the N word, but that segregated life, I I think, is, is so internalized. Our white neighborhoods are not a fluke. Mm-hmm. They didn't, you know, just happen. Exactly. I didn't just happen to grow up in a, in a primarily white neighborhood, right? This is the result, as you as you pointed out, of of decades of policies and practices. You know, de jure in the past, de facto in the present. You know, white people will go across town. We will be incredibly inconvenienced to get our children into a quote unquote exactly. better school. Right. But, oh, gosh, you know, I don't know anybody of color um, and I don't know how to meet them. If you cared, you'd put the energy into figuring that out. Yes, you would. It's really not that difficult. Right. Because white people are resourceful. If they really wanted or someone had made it a value for them, it would have happened. I almost feel that when people have that conversation with me, they want me to validate that um, there are too few blacks. Mm -hmm. and, And so please acknowledge that because. I've adopted cross culturally, you know, as a white couple, we've adopted black children. We've done, we've, we've done enough and we have no, we have no black friends. And, um, and I try to say, you got to find them. And they look at me and say, well, they're not in my community. Where do I go to find, find black people? Um, and I say, you know, for the sake of your children, even if you have not realized the value, I've watched what's happened in situations like this, where children are afraid of their own culture. And I watch how that plays Mm -hmm. out on, you know, on middle school playgrounds. And so I think you're absolutely right. Too few people have really valued what that means to have those cross-cultural relationships, particularly ones that are deep and meaningful. Yeah, if we're looking for um, challenging this this 
system to be convenient for us as white people, uh, you know, well, that, that isn't going to happen. It's not comfortable and it's not convenient. You know, the, the status quo of this society is racism. It's not an aberration. Right. It, it is right. the norm. And all of our institutions effectively and efficiently reproduce uh, racial inequity. And that status quo of racial inequity is comfortable for me as a white person 24-7. Uh, we are not sure, going to sure. get to where we need to go from a place of uh, white comfort and convenience. You know, it takes, you know, building our tolerance for uh, discomfort and actually, you know, getting out of that comfort zone uh, and putting some effort into changing. Sure. Hey, Dr. D'Angelo, as you've talked with people um what makes the realization of what you just stated that that racism is the norm it's, it's the rule and not the exception is it the fact that i'm going if i'm white i'm going to lose what i thought was earned through meritocracy is it that emotionally i cannot fathom that my idealism of america has been built on on um on this on this falsehood um is it is it the guilt is it e all the above what i understand that these things are real because i look at history but for white people who listen to what you're saying, that this is the norm and they, what are they afraid of losing or what are they afraid of becoming if they acknowledge what you just stated and what you and I believe to be true? I think, uh, yes, all of the above, right? Uh-huh. There, there's sure. not one single kind of thread. There's all of those threads. Uh, probably at the base is the what I call the good bad binary. That um, it's it's this very simplistic idea that um, only people who are uh, consciously and intentionally mean across race uh, are racist, and mm-hmm, um, they're mm-hmm. not nice people. And so, if I'm a nice person, uh, I can't be racist. I mean, whenever right. uh, it is suggested in the popular culture that somebody's behaved in a racist way, what's the first thing they do? Uh, you know. Uh, get all their friends to say what nice people they are. So we sure. often become very irrational uh, on this topic, particularly if we're challenged. I think uh, um, this will maybe be controversial for you, listeners. Oh, but I was I don't hoping know how you could talk about racism without having to be controversial. Sure, I sure. I think at a fund at a fundamental level, we actually think this racist status quo is appropriate because we are fundamentally better people, and we deserve to be where we are. Uh, you know, from the time I opened my eyes, that message has been circulating. Uh, I have internalized it. I, I think we need to, those of us who are white, need to take a really hard, honest look at internalized superiority. That we, um, that this this setup is righteous, even, morally righteous, again, because we're fundamentally better sure, people. Sure, sure. And there are many, many ways that can help you access that message and challenge it, uh, but nobody misses it, right? So that's one piece. Uh, another piece is what I call the good-bad binary, mm-hmm. this idea that only mean, intentionally mean people sure. can be racist, right? right. That uh, racism is consists of acts by people who don't like, you know, others based on their race and want to hurt them. I mean, that definition just function so beautifully to protect the system of racism uh, because it, it exempts virtually all white people from that system, right? Yes. And I think it's the, the root of a lot of white defensiveness, so that if you were to suggest right now that the way that I'm talking about this, for example, is revealing a racist worldview that I'm not aware of, I'm going to hear that as you just said, I, uh, I had a bad moral character. Uh, right, and, you know, right. That, and and that can't be true because I don't. And, right. Um, and I didn't mean to do that. Therefore, it shouldn't count. And you know, we've heard it. We've heard it all. So that understanding of what racism is uh, in dominant culture also helps uh, hold it in place, and, and you get the reactions that you get. Uh, individualism is a very precious ideology for oh, white of course. people. Of course. Of course. Now, racially, racially, it's only granted to white people, but this idea that, you know, I could just have decided to be completely unaffected by the water I'm swimming in, and that you need to see me as separate from that water and separate from all other uh, white people. I, I think probably the, the number one thing that, that gets white people defensive whenever I give a talk uh, is generalizing about white people. Sure. We don't like to be gener- generalized about. Um and, you know, I get lots of emails, uh, you know, about, you know, how each person who's writing me is different from everything I'm saying, uh, which right. for me proves my point. But 
yes, we are individuals. Uh, we are also members of a racial group by virtue of that membership. We could literally predict whether my mother and I were going to survive my birth. It's so significant, and we have to be willing to grapple with the collective experience of being a member of this racial group. Uh, and everything that we see as special and unique about ourselves as white people, just ask yourself, well, how did that set me up into the racial it, hierarchy? Exactly, exactly. Exactly. It, because it did, right? I, I grew up poor, you grew up middle, middle class. How did our class position set us up? Uh, they certainly didn't exempt us, you know? Sure, sure. I talked to so many folks who have said, hey, Alex, my grandmother came here. She couldn't speak the language. Mm-hmm. She took a boat from Poland. And look, she got a job. She didn't have, Her parents weren't here. She sent money back home when they got her siblings. But they don't count in the social construct of race what she had access to that when she dressed up, put on a nice dress, when her husband put on a nice suit, um, when they decided to be white and not Polish American, Irish American, Italian American, it gave them different, um, it it gave them different access. And I've been, I have just understood that's just such a, such a difficult concept um, for folks, for folks to, to, to grab because again, they're looking at it as an individual that your grandmother came over, but she was welcomed into a whole system as long as she was white. She could get HUD loans. She could get FHA loans. Her husband could go to war and come back and get a GI Bill and acquire wealth by buying a house. Folks don't realize that that was kept um, that that was kept away from so many people. Like here in Madison, uh, my organization. Um, has created a U.S. Black History course. We call it History for a New Day, and it's for it's mainly for white individuals. We have we have tenured faculty members from the University of Wisconsin come and teach. And what's interesting is that when people show up, and this again is designed for white people, they look around and they say, "We thought we we're going to talk about Black history with Black people. We didn't know it's going to be a room full of white people and white people on the stage." Almost as if they're sickened by the fact that they're in a sea of whiteness, and we're going to talk about race. How am I going to learn about my racism? With white people, I need black people here to teach me what racism is. And those are for, that's from my progressive friends in a college town like Madison. Well, let's be honest. They're only sickened by a sea of whiteness when the topic is race. I mean, we live <laughs> in a sea of whiteness that we're not sickened by. They're not sickened by, um, by downtown Rotary. I mean, no. I think our Rotary is only eclipsed by Seattle, which has like the nation's one of the nation's largest. But you're right. When they're in that white space, um, downtown exclusive clubs, you're right. They're not sickened yeah. by it at all. No, they weren't sickened by their wedding being all white. <laughs> I, mean, I want to say that because it's not just right. you know the upper classes, right? Um, so a couple of things. Sure. One, it behooves us. It behooves us not to see this, right? It behooves us to tell that story because it exempts us uh, from the uh, benefits that we gain from being white. Uh, it it just and it protects. The, the racist status quo, yes, right, which we are invested in protecting. I mean, that's the question that has um, never failed me. It's not, is this true or is this false? But how does that narrative function? What happens when you're trying to talk about your experience as a black man, when you're trying to get racism on the table and a white person moves to that narrative? What does it do? Well, it, it exempts them from any part of, of the current, you know, hierarchy, it sure. takes racism off the table, it silences you, and and it closes the exploration, and in doing that, it functions to protect the racist hierarchy and the white position within it. Um, and I, I can't help but notice, when do we want to say that the past shapes us? Right. When do we want right. to invoke our grandmothers or our great-grandmothers? And then when do we want to say, gosh, get over it, um, you know, Slavery ended. Right, right, and not taking into account that there was a sim- there was a, a system or a systemic way of thinking that even made slavery possible. And even when slavery was illegalized, the mentality and the attitude was not illegalized because you can't legislate relationships or attitudes. And so, what people forget is the you know the 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 infrastructure that created slavery and made it possible also created Jim Crow and separate but equal realities. And that that hasn't gone away. And we're trying to get at that. Right. It's also very interesting to me that 400 years of slavery seems to mean nothing to to, to 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 many whites because that was years ago. But 60 years of affirmative action has completely ruined our country. So four centuries of forced and free labor. Yeah. That's over. Just get over it, black people. But, you know, this frickin six, six, 60 years 
uh, affirmative action, which gave kickbacks to white organizations. I mean, it wasn't just, you know, working for people of color. It's just so interesting. You measure 60 years and 400 years and people think that we can ruin the country in 60, but we have completely gotten over 400 years of slavery. Well, and also, yes, and look at the outcome of affirmative action. It, it was a relatively toothless program that only applied to um, public companies or private companies with uh, 50,000 uh, employees mm-hmm. or 50,000, you know, it, it, and it benefited white women more than any yes. other group. If you look around, I think it's yes. pretty clear affirmative action, which is almost completely gone at this point sure has you know not it's made a difference but not a great difference right you know it has been said when you're used to a hundred percent 98 feels oppressive Mm. that's (laughs) that is that is that is so true and the fact that affirmative action has has had such a powerful and positive impact for white women who have not practiced Mm. intersectionality which is a concept that my daughter, who's a grad student, has helped me to understand that even yeah. even among women, um, it, it did not build a sense of solidarity across the racial lines to really bring, bring black women along. And so I just think it's important for those who are in progressive towns like my own. And I've chosen to stay in Madison. So I don't say what I do to bash it, but I say what I do because I want Madison to wake up and to really be a place that's progressive and not just a place that that really that really talks about it. Hey everybody, this is Tyler, the podcast manager of Black Like Me. Just wanted to jump on and share two quick things about Black Like Me. Number one, Patreon. Patreon is an opportunity for you if you like our show at all, if you enjoy it, if you want us to keep creating this content to be able to support us financially and to help us do that. If you're as little as $2 a month, you can join our team. We also have some other higher tiers with some more benefits if you join. So please go to patreon.com slash blacklikeme to hear more. Number two is that if you are interested in having Dr. G speak, if you're interested in him doing some consulting for you, your organization, anything like that, you can go to alexg.com slash contact and you can fill out a form to be able to see how you might be able to bring Dr. G to your business or your community. All right, back to the show. I I want to bring up something that I saw, another quote of yours, or maybe it's a a discussion starter in the guide for for your book, White Fragility, but I loved it. When we often talk about racial barriers in governmental and corporate organizations, we think of white men. We even have the phrase, the man, stick it to the man. The man's trying to keep us down. You know, outside of my church work, I also run a nonprofit that I started 27 years ago. I bump heads with white women all the time because white men are not dominant in this world. I mean, in this field. And so when I started creating a movement called Justified Anger and I said black people have got to create an agenda, many of my white colleagues who are women went to our mutual funders and they said, G is creating this work and he's being exclusive. He's not telling us what's going on. And then I've been in meetings like with my alma mater, the University of Wisconsin, other places when many times I've called um, these these colleagues on the carpet. The tears, the crying, and I'm not trying to state for my for my friends on Black Like Me. I'm not just trying to say because someone's female, they're emotional and they cry at every at the drop of the hat. Mm-hmm. I, I'm I'm 55 years old. I have seen more white women cry over race than anything else in the workplace. And I just I, am I crazy? Can you help me speak to it? I talk to black <laughs> women in the space. They say, hey, Alex. White women ain't nothing nice when it comes to power structure because there's still the sense of white privilege. But then when the tears start flowing, it stops the whole meeting. And we're forgetting that we were talking about how a child was treated, how a family was treated, how a woman was treated. And all of a sudden, all the tension goes to the person who says, I thought we were better than this. I thought by being a white woman, I understand oppression, too. Da, 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 da. Can you help me with that? I guess you can hear my emotion on this, Dr. (laughs) D'Angelo. I I just need you to calm me down. What is going on with white women in these places? (laughs) Well, I mean, mean, you pretty pretty clearly and beautifully (laughs) laid that out. Um, so l- let me just say, um, white women, uh, we do not land any more lightly on people of color. Mm. Uh, we are in no way have been consistently allied with people of color. And I actually think when white women don't back people of color, that the hurt and the betrayal is deeper. Because mm. we have a mm. potential way in through yes. Yes. sexism and patriarchy, and we so often use it as a way out. So all of the dynamics that we see that we might complain about from men, um, we are manifesting uh, across race. 
right? Wow. Um, I agree. Yeah. So there's a there's a photo that I often show in my in my slides of this. Uh, it's, the, it's the House Freedom Caucus. So it's a room just filled 100 percent with white men around a conference table, and mm-hmm. you know, talk about. Um, what would it be like to be in that room, you know, as a woman, and your job is to help them see their sexism, and all the women are like, yeah, and, you know, I'm like, would you want to sign up for being the one all by yourself to go in there and try to talk to those men about sexism, and all the women like, oh, God, no. And then I flash a a photo (laughs) of a conference table, all white women. And then I say, women of color, you want to go in there and help those white women see their racism? And they're all like, oh, God, no, right? And my point is, can I can be in that first room filled with men and, and experience all kinds of sexism, and I can be in that second room and be perpetrating all kinds of racism. Yes. Right? Yes. So I am not exempt from any of those patterns. And um, there's a black woman I often co-lead with. Her name is Erin Trent Johnson. Mm-hmm. And she says that the room filled with white women, that room is way scarier for me. That is the most treacherous room for me. Because the moment I am smart, the moment I uh, am strong, uh, they're going to feel threatened, and they're going to rally around each other, right? I don't, I don't have expectations, she says, in that room filled with white men. But in the room filled with white women, the white women are going to assume there's some kind of shared woman sisterhood. You know, there's no more a, a shared woman's experience than there is a shared human experience. Right. In a society, on the physical plane, in a society that's just profoundly separate and equal by race and gender. So white women, we have to stop using our resentment about sexism, which, you know, is uh, sure. quite uh, rational. Right. We have to stop using it to exempt ourselves. We have to start using it as a way in. So whenever I don't understand a piece of racism, I just change the roles in my head. And I imagine that a man is saying to me, you know, on sexism, what I'm kind of wanting to say around race. And I'm mm-hmm, like, oh, mm-hmm. I got it. I got it. Right. Right. Um, and, and as you said, you know, part of being white is not having to understand our history and that we bring it with us. And you, you, I might, see, I might see myself as Robin, your colleague, but I'm pretty sure you see me as Robin, my white colleague. And when I start mm-hmm. crying, I am a white woman crying. Yes. And there is a history of terror that is invoked through those tears. Um, I, I mean, I just need to say yes. Emmett Till. And, you know, that history is invoked. But part of being white is I don't have to attend to any of that. I, I just right. see myself as entitled to indulge in whatever I'm feeling right now. And I may not be conscious, but the tears do have an impact on the room. Because as soon as I cry, all of the resources are going to get channeled back to me. And now yes. you're going to become the aggressor. Yes. Right? And Yes. And I'm going to become the victim. So you're, you're sharing wow. about your victimization. Wow. I start to cry, and all of a sudden you're the aggressor, and everyone's comforting me. Uh, and whatever it was you said that caused me to cry is long forgotten. It's long, it's long forgotten. And then you don't, I don't want to be the black man that's, that's coming down hard on, on someone who's a white woman. And my sister who works in nonprofit space says, you know, then she gets get categorized as the bitchy black woman who's rolling her neck, who's got an attitude. And, yeah. and, and so when you, when, right, when we stand up for ourselves, we, we, you know, we get all this pushback. You know, white people, we need to ask ourselves why is my heart not breaking, right? Where is oh my, my grief? Yes. Where are my tears? But our tears uh, have uh, impact on other people. So where, when, and why I'm crying needs to be attended to. I just want to be really clear about that because mm-hmm. it's not as if we should not access that pain. Uh, but, but again, how and when and where we access it has political impact. Again, my my movement, the initiative of my nonprofit is called Justified Anger. It's about six years old and um, our history class is a part of it. We're doing work with emerging black leadership development and we're helping to work with systems to um, whether they're educational or corporate to really think about how they uh, how we empower them to dismantle racism within their within their ranks. But it's interesting for six years, white men who in corporate leadership 
roles, foundation roles, um, have tried to challenge me to change the name from justified anger than having a meaningful conversation with me about why does the anger persist? Yeah. Alex, you're a black man living in Fitchburg. You live in a you live in a nice home. You've been married 31 years. You, your mom, your sister, your wife, now your daughter all have degrees from the University of Wisconsin. My daughter's a grad student. Alex, you have an earned doctorate degree. And so they almost it feels like a sidebar. Like, Alex, we get that some people are angry, but come on. You're just like us. You live next door to us. Your daughter went to Catholic school. Come on. Just drop. You're not really angry. It's not really that bad. So I'm finding that I am marginalized as a black male who's seen as angry because it almost licenses people to not have to take me seriously. And I'm not I'm not irrational. I'm not yelling you know, like while the mayor is trying to give a speech, but I'm a writer, I'll give speeches, I'll preach about it, I'll bring groups together in our history class and I'll talk about it. But but as I gain more momentum and as more white people begin to listen, I feel that I'm more alienated by white men in leadership who used to love me 10 years ago. I'm the most tenured minister in our city when I was just the nice example. I was the poster man of, the, of what could happen if you're black and your mom's on welfare and you could become this civic community leader. But when I start challenging the systems, I get yep. tremendous pushback from from my friends, particularly my white male friends who are in corporate leaders, uh, leadership roles. I've got a couple that are not like that, but I've had so many sidebars like, why don't you call it justified action? Why don't you call it justified ability? Why don't you call it justified advancement? So I guess all of that to say what what's so fearful about a black man being angry at the status quo? Um, for many whites in society. What 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 is that what is that country? You know what? And I'm sorry, I don't mean to do for you what people do for me. I don't want you to speak for all <laughs> white people, but I feel like you're a colleague oh. and you're a resource. And oh, so sure. to give me just a cross section of it, but th- the fact that that I'm that I'm black and I'm angry now, I'm still at the table. Part of my mission is to help my white colleagues get this and walk across the line in order to be allies. I don't I don't try to convince um, you know, um, Charlottesville racists that, that they're wrong, but the yeah. progressives who yeah. want to make a difference. I have really, you know, whether it's the leadership of my church, leadership of my nonprofit, I've been consistent in really building that bridge because I grew up in Madison. So many of my relationships, most of them were with were with white, um, were white with were, were with white people. But when I've emerged as someone who's angry at the status quo, I'm really surprised at the sidebars people have with me, like they're trying to calm me down and I don't go off in meetings. I just say my experiences. Um, okay. The first thought I had was how, how are your, how are those white colleagues measuring success? In other words, if you have success based on class, you should no longer care about injustice. You should no longer have any passion about injustice. Mm-hmm. Uh, So that's worth looking at, right? You have a house, you have an education, why would you care uh, or have emotion? Uh, It also presumes that within that uh, middle class cultural context, you're not experiencing racism, right? Mm -hmm. Right, (laughs) Uh, right. I know it's patently not true. (laughs) And there's this, this incredible arrogance that white people have, right? Like rather than like tell you uh, that you shouldn't feel that way, Can you imagine the humility of us asking ourselves, well, what am I missing? What don't I understand? Absolutely. Um, What are the odds that I have some blind spots? And if Alex is expressing anger uh, and hurt and pain, uh, what am I not seeing rather than uh, Alex needs to experience the world the way I experience it? Which means don't actually have any uh, care about racial injustice. Right. So, so that's also going on. I just want to be really clear. Black anger is and rage is rational. Black yes, trust of white people and our schools and our teachers and our institutions is rational. Our lack of uh, rage is <laughs> irrational. I love it. Right. And, you know, we have earned your uh, rage and suspicion and mistrust. Uh, there's a deep history of harm between uh, our groups, yes. right? Uh, so we have to earn your trust. And we don't earn it by telling you that your your uh, rage is inappropriate, um, and right. we don't earn it by uh, asking you to coddle our delicate sensibilities and use different language. I mean, again, back to how does it function? And I think you made that it very clear sure. how it functions. 
when all the energy is on what we should call the the group, right? So that we don't, you know, cause any discomfort right. for white people, and how that prevents us from engaging with the you know issues that you're trying exactly. to get onto the table. I want to say something about white progressives. Yes. Yes. Okay. So you, you may have heard me, Alex, make this uh, yes this claim. White progressives. I think cause the most daily toxicity for people of color living and working in primarily white environments like Madison. See, now that statement right, right there is going to make us lifelong friends, Dr. D'Angelo, that statement right <laughs> there. Keep, keep going. You're, pre- you're preaching sister. I need, I need someone to say that. Um, I need who looks like you, who sounds like you, who studied like you yeah. to say that because if we can crack that nut in Madison, we can really change things. Cause I think people have the passion, but that that facade of being progressive makes us think we've already arrived. So please keep going. I just had to give you an accolade. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, that's all right. You know, well, first of all, how am I defining a white progressive? Sure, right? sure, that'd and be notice helpful. I don't say white liberal because then people be, start thinking it's Republican exactly, versus Exactly, exactly. A white progressive is any white person listening right now who thinks we're not talking about them. Right. Uh, a white progressive is any white person who thinks they're not racist, less racist, who's thinking about all the ways they're an ex- exception to everything we're talking about, mm-hmm. uh, who's sitting here thinking about all the other white people who really need to be hearing this conversation, um, whose number one question is going to be, how do I tell another white person about their racism? <laughs> that is a white progressive. And I think that we are the most challenging because we're so arrogant um, mm-hmm. of, in our certi- certitude that it isn't us. So we put our energy in making sure you know it isn't us, right? All right. our credentials, right. Right. which, of course, aren't remotely convincing to you. Right. Um, but, um, and we tend to be incredibly defensive about any suggestion uh, that we may not be as progressive racially as we think we are, Right. Um, so I think, um, I imagine that it, as a black man, it would be terrifying to have to interact with a Richard Spencer, right? Richard mm-hmm. Spencer is a, sure. what I would call an avowed racist. Definitely. He organized the march in Charlottesville. I mean, I, I think it would be terrifying to have to interact with him, but odds are you're not interacting with him on a daily basis. You're interacting with me. Right. Right. And I am the one who's sending you home on a daily basis. Uh, agonizing all night about whether uh, you should just endure the indignity that I inflicted on you in that meeting or whether you should try to talk to me about it. And then having you decide, you know what, odds are it will get worse if I try to talk to her about it. I'll just endure it. And, and right? she and she may and she may take revenge. You're you're right with, with the Richard oh, Spencer. Sure. I know how to dodge him, or I know how to put exactly. my defense mechanisms up. You, you touch upon something that that creates a mystery for white progressives in the area where I live, Madison, in the Greater Madison area. Many African Americans who have served to make this community great are buying land in South Carolina, North Carolina, Mississippi. They're moving to Atlanta. They're moving to Dallas. We're about to experience the greatest migration from of blacks from the north to the south in the history of this country. And it is completely um, mystifying my white colleagues because in the south, and I'm not saying every person in the south who's white is racist, but where there is racism, you know. Don't go. Like I have a friend who told me he's from he's from Stone Mountain. He said when he would go to certain places, the Rangers would say, "Hey, the Klan's meeting on the east side over there. So you might want to stay over there. Just go over here. Like you know, the Klan are out here, but they're not going to bother you. You know, you're going to go over here and cook out." In Madison, you're right. Everyone's got Black Lives Matter in their yard. They've got they they you know they talked about who they're reading and coats and all these things that they're quoting but still they don't have black friends they're not in black space Mm -hmm. they're not dismantling racism and they're rattling off the podcast that they're listening to but not anything that they're doing personally and so it completely stupefies my white colleagues to think that that there's a, a there's there's more rest for the black soul in the racist in racist parts of the South than in the progressive places like Wisconsin Minnesota et cetera they they don't get it because we're not dealing with the facade of this pseudo progressive mindset. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking I'd rather deal with someone uh, who I know is a misogynist so I can avoid him than someone who has deeply internalized misogynist attitudes and it's in complete denial about it. Yes. Um, That again is, is much more treacherous and you've named what happens when you try to even just, you know, say, I want to speak to my anger. 
you know, oh, you know, can we soften that and not do that? Um, I, I want to say, you said I, uh, that you're not saying all white people are racist, so I'll go ahead and say it. No, all no, I, no, no, I'm sorry. Racist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was saying no, that. Gonna, no, no, you're I, right. I, I understand why you don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. You're going to say it. Go ahead. Person. Say it again. I'll go. All white people are racist and only white people are racist. And if you're white and you're listening to that and you're <laughs> upset by that, then Ooh. it's on you to evolve and and uh, and figure out why am I saying that, not I'm wrong to say that. What are you missing that you don't understand why I would say that? Again, if we define racism as individual acts of intentional, aware meanness, then, of course, not all white people are racist. But racism is not that. It is a system. Exactly. And we've, we're swimming in it. We've internalized its messages, and they come out of our pores. And it's on us to figure out how those, that message of superiority comes out of our pores, but not if. Sure. We have to change the question from if to how. So let me give an example that really um, gets white progressives nice and unsettled. <laughs> uh, I am not any less racist than Trump. Ooh, I, I'm with you, but go ahead on. What's the difference then? All right. Yes. Um, so first of all, um, well, I'm younger than Trump. I'm not that much younger. Mm-hmm. I grew up in the same water. I swim in the same water. Yes. And there's nothing that comes out of his mouth that I don't recognize. And if white people are being honest, there, there aren't things that come out of his mouth that haven't shocked me because they flashed across my own mind in a moment. Right. That's just the so truth. Even you probably have been taken aback. Oh, my God, I can't believe I just had such a racist thought. Mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. Um, so I recognize all of his racism and I have on some level absorbed very similar mm-hmm. uh, messages and, uh, and ideas. It's not useful for me to position him as the racist and me as not the racist, because the moment I do that, I'm going to exempt myself. I'm going to be complacent and I'm going to be uh, defensive. There is a difference between us. Right. Yes. And it's not in how much racism we have. The difference is he embraces and uses. I would say wallows in his racism. Mm -hmm. He uses it to political ends. And I try to the best of my ability, uh, to challenge my racist conditioning. But uh, we're both on the same continuum. Mm -hmm. Uh, We may be on different spots in different moments. But that's the other piece. I'm not in a fixed location on that continuum. Sure. Uh, In some some moments, um, I act in anti-racist ways. But, But in some moments, I choose silence and complicity and comfort. And in those moments... Uh, I'm not that far away from him. That's a very gutsy and and honest statement, Dr. D'Angelo. I appreciate that. One of the analogies I use here in Madison is that we have we're surrounded by four beautiful lakes, but we're having an issue with with phosphorus and with with algae and it's affecting mm-hmm. or infecting the fish. And so the fish aren't bad and they're not they're not polluting the lakes, but the lakes are harming them. And so I I try to explain to my white colleagues when I talk to you about your racism, I'm not saying that as an individual, you're burning a cross on my lawn, but I'm saying yeah. that to some extent you've been infected by this truth, by, by these lies, by these falsehoods, by falsified history that you've been infected in a way that, that you become a part of the problem and you benefit from the problem, but fish aren't mm-hmm. creating the problem, but they are sickened because of it. And so I try to help my white colleagues to understand that to the degree I could help you to understand your racism, you can get better. But if you ignore this, it's going to it's going to sicken you and make you worse. And so you really need what we're talking about to come to the light and get better because it's underlying fear that you're going to be discovered for not being all that society has told you you are is really is really problematic. And so that's a way that I've tried to approach it. With, with people in understanding this. And then the second part of it is in Madison, and this is this is probably how progressives roll. But I've had several people tell me the worst thing that they can be called is a racist. And I'm thinking, come on, with all the abuse against children, children being separated from their parents and put yeah. in cages. There are a lot worse things to be in life than racist. And so black people, people of color are assuming not that white people are evil. But that they are racist because of the definition I just gave about being infected, the definition you just gave. Mm -hmm. There's the assumption. So the the, the sooner you acknowledge it, the more we can get to a whole nother place. And to your point that I saw in one of your quotes, 
I have found that it is easier to build deeper cross-cultural relationships with white colleagues who have never come in contact with black people and own it than progressives who immediately Mm -hmm. have dropped the N-word because they told me, well, when I was 16, I used to be a good baller. And so the fellas used to let me say it. And so they try to transport that experience 30 years in the future and then drop it on me over a cob salad, you know, while they're trying to coach me and speaking at their event. So they drop the N word to show me that it has no power in their minds and that it, that it doesn't, Mm -hmm. that that they're so far above it, they can say it and not be impacted by it. That's what I experienced with, with, um, with progressives. I don't have people saying that to me when I'm in Mississippi. Yeah. You know, I I just have to say on behalf of my fellow white people, I apologize to you for that. I just want to say that, like, that, that <laughs> thank, somebody would thank drop you. that word over your lunch and, and, and tell you it has no meaning. Uh, I, I'm very sorry. Um, thank you. So let me be cl- clear. Everyone has racial bias. So yes, yes. You're just as racially biased as I am. But when you back one group's racial bias with legal authority and institutional control, yeah, when you it sanction it. And that's what I mean when yes. I say only white people are racist and all white people are racist. I, I love that you use those those lakes as, as um, an example, because um, I just had the honor of having uh, a meeting with Resma uh, Menikam, who mm-hmm. wrote My Grandmother's Hands. He's, he's a black man who specializes in racial trauma. Sure. And he says, you know, don't look at the shark. Look at the water. Right. So mm. we, we might think that Donald Trump is a shark. But he's in the water, yes, and we're yes. in the water, too. Those fish are in that water, and they're swimming in it, and they're consuming it. Uh, and that's how those of us who are white have to think about um, getting in touch with how, what we've consumed, right? Yes. And it's uh, Ibram Kendi, in his book, uh, Stamp from the Beginning, says, you know, we are not the, the creators of racist ideology, but we are the consumers of racist ideology. See, that's and powerful. no white person can miss consuming racist ideology. This is what I mean when I say I have a racist worldview as a white person. How could I not? So it's on us to try to identify how we've consumed it, how it's coming out in our relationships and our work, and then how we might change it. Sure. Sure. Um, you know, I was, no, that's, that's, that's good. I'm, this is going to help folks who are listening. Uh, it's going to help them tremendously because I'm finding that the bulk of my listeners um, are white who are really trying to lean in to racial issues and they're trying to, um, they're just trying to understand them more. How has this work um, helped or um, uh, encouraged you to build stronger cross-cultural relationships? Because one of the questions I hear among um African Americans, when when someone who is white, um, you know, develops a hit podcast or writes a New York, you know, New York Times bestseller yeah. about race or something, they wonder: Does it open doors, or do people do people do those folks f- still feel the need to build cross cultural relationships? And so I know that's that's personal, but I know people who are listening are wondering: um, You know, do you, do you have cross cultural relationships? Has this work? Um, enabled you to build more meaningful cross-cultural relationships, particularly with African-American people? Oh, absolutely. So the first thing I want to say is this is the most liberating premise I I can imagine, that the premise that um, as a white person, I I have a racist worldview, I have racist biases, I have racist patterns, Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I have investments. I have investments. Uh, in, in the racist status quo, which is why I can't be trusted to determine how well I'm doing, right? right Challenging right. that status quo. Starting from that premise is liberating, right? I can right. stop defending, deflecting, denying, explaining, minimizing, deflecting, you know, all those things sure. that we do to avoid that. And just get to work aligning what I say I value with the actual practice of my life. Like, what does it mean to say everyone's equal and live uh, segregated from them, mm-hmm. right? What mm-hmm. are we really teaching our children when we talk about how good their neighborhood and school is precisely because it's segregated, right? Right, right. So it, it, it is liberating, and I do now have relationships across race and with black people that I would not have had if I just followed the trajectory mm-hmm. laid before me, mm-hmm. right? I don't have to do anything. Just follow the trajectory laid out for you as a white person, and odds are very, very high that you will uh, live a segregated life. You know, if you're, if you're urban and white and poor, 
in your early life, you may have cross-racial relationships. Sure. But uh, upward mobility will take you away. Uh, and Definitely. You will, if you're going to move up, you'll, you'll move into whiter and whiter spaces. And I, I think we, we always know that. Anybody, any white person listening who is going to that, but I grew up poor, I, I would ask you to read my essay, My Class Didn't Trump My Race, because mm. I grew up in poverty. Sure. Uh, and I also always knew I was white. Come on. Please. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> so, yes, I absolutely have those relationships. And I know that I need to be accountable uh, as a white person who's granted credibility and authority uh, on race. Right. I, I'm very clear that my work centers whiteness. I mean, I don't know any way out of that dilemma because it centers whiteness. But also, I, I do leave it decenters whiteness by exposing whiteness mm-hmm. because that water stays the water because we don't see it. Right. right? And so to, to decenter it in a very curious way, you have to make it more visible. So I donate a percentage of my income to racial justice organizations that are uh, led by people of color. Uh, I, I have love people it. of color in my life who have agreed to play that kind of coach and go to and mm-hmm. talk through mm-hmm. things with, and I pay them for that. Come on now. To be really That's clear. what I'm talking about, Dr. Yes, D'Angelo. Come on. So they're not just yeah. your little freebie <laughs> black friends who will come and just. No. Thank you. No, having. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> having, having black friends is not an accountability practice. I just want to be really, it's not. And it's not for you. I mean, if you're my friend, you may, you may want to school me on education. Um, but it, that is not where, you know, my expectation that you, you know, that is what you need to give me. Um, I, I would pay you for your time. Uh, there are also white people in my life with a very strong analysis that sure, I can call sure. when I need to process my feelings. Let's say you called me in right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I may feel embarrassed. I may feel defensive. Um, it is not for you to hold or have to bear witness to that. So I would call a white friend and say, I need to talk. I need to vent, you know, yes, so yes. that I could get clearer and come back and repair with you. Um, these are just some examples of how white people can be accountable, but out, without that, just carrying on, no. No, that's so helpful because what, what's becoming popular in in the circles of my friends, I stopped this a long time ago because um, I started telling white corporations, um, I'm not in the business of keeping you in business, but I can be, but you have to hire me. Mm-hmm. But you can't just assume yep. because I'm a black minister or a black nonprofit executive that it's my job to find you black staff. But I'm I'm hearing yep. of white CEOs, men and women who have said to black staff, I want your job to be um, telling me when I've said something inappropriate. The, mm. And uh, there's a young lady I know who's who's who's. Yeah, she's no longer at that organization, but her boss told her. It's your job. And she said, that's not my job. She goes, oh, yeah, it's in your job description. So you, uh, so on a good day, uh, you can call your boss out. But on a bad day, you call your boss out in front of other colleagues. How do we how, how does she not think that her job can be jeopardized? Yeah. But I'm finding in a community like this that people think that they're open by saying, hey, if I ever say anything that's inappropriate, come and come and tell me. And black people are thinking, no, no, we're not. We're, first of all, we don't want that pressure. Two, you're you're the you're the executive director of this of this organization. And three, it could I could then be pegged as an angry black woman inside this organization who's always got issues. And so I'm not going to get um, letters of recommendation, nor am I going to be promoted inside this company. But I know of several colleagues who have been told that that's their role. So I just want to point out for your white listeners that throughout this conversation, you have um, explained and, and laid out all of the, the moves white progressives make, or many of the moves. So, so this is the stuff, right? This yes. isn't the, I said, the N-word stuff. This is, this is the attitude and the entitlement and the expectation. So, so let me break down what's problematic about uh, that woman's boss saying that to her. Yes. So the first thing is, um, it, it puts all the emotional weight and labor and psychic energy and heavy lifting on the
a person of color yes, it and does. the white person can just walk away, you know, yep, hey, let me know and carry on with no effort whatsoever. It's a colonialist relationship. You do all that work and all that labor and take all that risk. And I will receive the fruits of your labor. Uh, and I will examine those fruits. And let's be honest. And I will determine which of them I think are legitimate and which of them exactly, I can. Exactly. Uh, but I will do. Because that's also what's going to happen is when she tells this boss, uh, what she's experiencing, they're going to sit back and feel qualified to determine what of it is valid and what isn't. And right. you know, that's another dynamic of it. But but again, I get to just walk away and carry on and just, you know, you'll let me know. And it doesn't account in any way for the incredible difference in power and risk that that takes. If if any white women are listening, just imagine a, a man just said to you, hey, hey, just let me know if I do anything sexist, and then just walked away. Right. Uh, well, I mean, that is a huge risk in our experiences. It'll be, you I'm just sure did. You just did something. You just did something sexist by putting that on me to tell you when you're being sexist. Exactly. And um, how often? OK, I'll ask you as a black man. How often have you tried to tell a white person about some uh, inevitable but unaware racist thing that they've said or done and have that go well for you? Right. Yeah. How's that? How's that working for Honestly, you? Right. Hey. How often that gone well for you? So now with this deep lifelong experience of being actually punished further by telling right. a white person, you just told me as your employee to tell you. Right. So there's that piece of it, too. And then the final piece is um, that that presumes that she understands what is racist in every moment and what is right. Right. I mean, I if we'll go, if we go back to sexism. I was raised in patriarchy. Sure. Um, half the time I'm colluding with sexism. I, I don't even know how I'm colluding with it. So that's Very a good lot point. to put on me to be super clear uh, about, you know, I'm certainly clearer about it than, than most white men are, but uh, I'm not completely clear about it. So, yes, that can be a piece of it, right, to convey mm -hmm. and earn her trust that she could tell him. But it's also on him to get better at recognizing it himself. Sure, so sure. she doesn't have to, right? Exactly. Where's, you, where's his responsibility? Exactly. Wow. Well, Listen, Dr. D'Angelo, I really appreciate your time and your insight. It, let me say that again. Dr. D'Angelo, I really appreciate your time and your insight. And I think that you have spoken powerfully um, into my context because I'm working with people in my community who really do want to make a difference. But I think it's the facade of being progressive that hinders it. Mm -hmm. And I just believe that our discussion today will give people something to, to listen to and to process further because I believe the goodwill is here. And in many folks, it's here. If we can get away from the, 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 um, the sticker shock of what it's going to cause us to really be anti-racist. Um, people in our history class can't just come and objectify the information and say, wow, that was thought provoking and not count the cost of how that has benefited them um, and worked against others that people must our white colleagues must do work among themselves to dismantle this yeah. and not just um, um, see to it that it's incumbent upon people of color to fix it. So. <laughs> and um, can I make a couple? Uh, I have three final points I want to make. Please, so please. No, no, no. And I should okay. have asked you that. Please do it. That's okay. Um, so there's a concept that I think of as credentialing, right? All of the evidence white people give to convey or signal that they're not racist, mm -hmm. right? And I would ask your listeners to, if, who are white, how do you credential yourself, right? Great uh, question. And if I told you that people of color notice when we're doing that, um, how do you think it's actually impacting the conversation, right? right? And one of the ways white people credential themselves is tell tell what they're reading, or is, sometimes people will try to credential themselves with me, right? Well, I, I've read your book. <laughs> and my response to that is, well, how will people of color know you've read my book? Great question. Right? Or you, go, you do a workshop and you go around the table at the end, you know, what's one thing you're going to do different? I'm going to continue to reflect on this. <laughs> and my response is, and how will people of color know yes. that you continue to reflect yes. on this? Like, what difference does it make if, if there isn't some, act, you know, actual behavior change? Right. And I want to I wanna make very clear, especially to Madison listeners, niceness is not anti-racism. Yes. And niceness is not courageous. Uh, 
you know, so many white people think that, you know, if I'm nice to you, Alex, and we're having this conversation and I'm smiling and I'm talking and we're going to lunch, I can't be racist. Right. Uh, we, we really have, that day, I'm sure you know, as you know, <laughs> over that lunch, I could easily uh, just a little microaggression, little nick, little cut, yes, yes. You know, even as I'm smiling and talking, as you mentioned, over your cob salad, right? Um, niceness is better than meanness. I'm all for niceness, yes. but that isn't anti-racism. Uh, so anti-racism true. is courageous and active. And yes. any white person who's been listening to you and I and doesn't agree with us, I'm going to yes. offer them a final question to sit with. What qualifies you to disagree with Alex and I on the topic of racism? Alex right. as a black man who, not just because he's a black man, but a black man who has devoted many years to this uh, education mm-hmm. field, mm-hmm. and me who... Uh, has devoted 25 years to this education and field. What qualifies you to disagree with us? Is it possible that there's something you're missing, not us? And certainly there are people Mm -hmm. I see as qualified to disagree with me, but they're likely not the average white person. Correct. That's a great question. That that is fantastic. And with that... I want to thank you again, Dr. D'Angelo. That was a, that's a powerful way to end the to end the show. So please know that I respect your work tremendously. I'm, I appreciate the fact that you're out here in the field. And I just hope that in this work, our paths um, will cross again. And I really I, it just meant a lot to me to have you be a part of Black Like Me. And I know that this is going to carry great weight and it's going to help so many people. So thank you again for your time. And I look forward to connecting with you again sometime in the future. You are so welcome. It was an honor and a delight. I want to thank Corey Saffold and Marcus Fleming for creating the music for this podcast. My podcast manager, Tyler Nyland. My engineer, Eli Steenlidge. My editor, Jeremy Holliday. And our intro and outro are recorded by Cynthia Woodland. And a special thank you to WORT Studios, where we record Black Like Me. Thank you for listening to today's podcast. You can find out more about Dr. Alex G's amazing work at www.alexg.com. Black Like Me is sponsored by the generosity of the Human Family Unity Foundation.